Welcome to Resia, the research seminar in Islamic art. Um, I'm very glad to introduce you Tofik Dadli, who is uh, talking to us tonight from Jerusalem. And Tofik is uh, an archaeologist and an art historian. He teaches at the departments of Middle Eastern studies and art history at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, his research is on archaeology. Um, he's done uh, several excavations in Jerusalem, Alid, uh, Sinabra, among others, but also his research is in art history, research in Persian painting, in particular Timurid uh, illustrated manuscripts. And in fact, his book, Esoteric Images Decoding the Late Herat uh, School of Painting, uh, was published by Brill in 2019. Um, today, Tofik is going to talk to us on new finds within a famous so-called Umayyad desert castle, that of Herbert al -Mafja. Um, He's published an article already on this in the Jerusalem Journal of Arabic and Islamic Art in 2019, volume 46. But he, uh, the work continues, his work in progress, and we are looking forward to further publications soon. So thank you very much, Tofik, for joining us tonight, and over to you. Just to remind the, the audience to write your, your questions and your points in the chat, and I will uh, put them to Tofik at the end of his seminar. Okay, Tofik. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, I will share my uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> so uh, thank you again for uh, this inv invitation to this interesting uh, seminar uh, with a very like uh, uh, interesting topics that I uh, already listened and uh, participated uh, to some of. Um, and as, as you said, I will uh, talk about uh, some uh, frescoes, some uh, wall paintings from uh, Khirbat al-Mafjar. And I have to thank um, uh, first uh, uh, Professor Donald Wiltcom, uh, who uh, uh, a decade ago started uh, or restarted, let's say, went to excavate again in Khirbat and mafzar with the uh, Palestinian Antiquity Authority. And so the Rockefeller Museum, uh, Archaeological Museum in Jerusalem, uh, initiated um, like said, a project to look for uh, old materials from uh, Khirbat and mafzar and they uh, found some files uh, with uh, paintings and in this way I um, ended working on those uh, paintings. So I also would like to thank uh, Foundation Max van Bershem, uh, who um, like, uh, yeah, like allowed me to uh, conduct such a, such a research uh, out of a generous uh, scholarship um, that allowed me to scan, to work, and to research those um, um, paintings. So, um, Khirbat al mafjar a um, well-known site for uh, archaeologists or art historians of the uh, Islamic uh, period. It was uh, extensively uh, excavated by uh, Dmitry uh, Baramki uh, during the years 1934-1948. Uh, a portion of the results of the 12 excavation seasons was published by Baramki in uh, preliminary reports in the Quoda, uh, and later in an almost complete uh, report by Hamilton. In that publication, Rob Robert Hamilton uh, discusses the building methods and different decorations, mosaic, stucco, stone relief, and fresco. While his publication served as the basis for further scholarly analysis of the royal uh, complex, little attention was paid to the frescoes. Um, and here we have a general um, uh, look on, on the side. Uh, and this is a courtesy of, again, Donald Whitcomb back when they were working there. 
So what we have in Khirbat al mifjar are um, in two, are two main, let's say, units. And um, one is the bath, and especially the bath hole. And the other, the larger one, is the qasr or the main palace. Um, and the wall uh, frescoes were found by archaeologists on the floors of the palace and on the floor of the bath hole. Although most of the paintings were discussed by Oleg Grabar as part of Hamilton's publication on the palace, the recent discovery in the mandatory archive at the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem of two large files containing aquarelles copies of the frescoes has generated renewed interest in them. So um, my main focus will be uh, on the palace but I will also refer uh, to at least stucco, uh, not fresco, in uh, the bath or the hammam of this uh, unit. So the majority of, uh, of the paintings were found in the eastern wing of the palace. So we have uh, here the rooms, uh, one, two, three, and four, and northern portico and southern portico as indicated by uh, the excavator. So, uh, and most of the pieces I will introduce are from this part, the eastern part. Um, so, uh, evidence from uh, rooms in the eastern uh, wing suggests that they didn't contain wall paintings as no trace of frescoes uh, was found on the extant walls of these uh, ground floor rooms. The assumption, therefore, is that they fell from an upper floor. Uh, Hamilton suggests a possible partial reconstruction of this upper floor. Um, and he is like um, uh, referring also to Qasr uh, Kharana uh, with an um, upper floor where you have also uh, private rooms or audience uh, halls, so it's not exceptional to Khirbat al mafsha that you have such a special uh, room on the uh, first floor, not the ground floor. So, um, but before we delve into uh, reconstruction and talking about the um, paintings, I would like to uh, um, like give, give a slide about methods. So I'm here uh, following uh, somehow uh, the excavator Baramki and Hamilton method. We have here um, uh, materials, artifacts, or let's say um, architectural pieces first uh, excavated uh, or uncovered, then sorted, uh, as you see, uh, and then somehow reconstructed. Uh, of course, you have this uh, from the material on the ground and then to somehow imagination. So this, uh, I will try to be in between those two uh, lines, uh, materials, and then imagining how they supposed to stand or how they were standing um, on site, let's say. Uh, moreover, as we can see in this picture, uh, we are dealing at least with three elements, or perhaps should I say three, three time dimensions. Uh, the time when the remains were uncovered, uh, represented here with not so a pleasant, let's say, man holding a stick with two kids uh, standing in front of him, and they are like uh, part of the um, workers. Uh, so this is the present time of uh, retrieving and excavating back. Um, and then we have a uh, thick earth layer uh, beneath this uh, man, and this is like um, uh, the excavation, and below it we have this layer of uh, remains collapsed, and the time when, uh, like uh, those remains, uh, the third line is the, when the time uh, remains were standing. Like so, we have the palace uh, living, let's say, and then collapse, and then excavators or ex archaeologists coming and uh, retrieving those. Uh, so um, it is somehow um, uh, dealing with, um, I, I don't know if you would like, would like to, but it's, it's like having a piece of furniture from Ikea 
and you have the pieces, but you lost the manual. So this is, uh, in general, uh, how I uh, like to imagine those materials and how you have to deal with them. More about this uh, excavator and um, Baramk, especially document well documented his uh, work on on ground. So you have a sequence of different um, uh, like pictures here all from the same um, area and this is related to the area I will focus on and this is the main entrance to the um, palace or the Qasr. So we have uh, this pile of stones collapsed with this um, marble column uh, in there and Baramki is documenting each step he is doing. By the end he will clear all of those um, like blocks uh, to open the entrance, but some of those blocks also uh, contained or were plastered and then painted with uh, the fresco. So um, this method or, or this uh, well-documented process helped me, uh, let's say, step and like step back and enter to um, uh, some sometimes missing materials uh, out of the circumstances, but uh, the, it helped me to understand from where those blocks are coming and how should I deal with them. So um, here I would like to show uh, those pictures, how a piece, a, an Ashlar block was first uncovered, then is out of context pictured. And we see here uh, this um, like face, and then uh, the third uh, step is to um, paint um, those um, pieces with those uh, aquarel uh, paintings. Uh, and with the aquarel paint paintings, I worked and I, I will present those uh, paintings. So it's not working with the original first, uh, let's say uh, the, the frescoes themselves, uh, um, um, like a big amount of them is not there anymore. I work with the uh, aquarels. So this is also we have to keep in mind uh, about colors and other things. I'm dealing with aquarels. Um, uh, so uh, in those files, there are a lot of uh, like I can say hundreds of, uh, of such pieces. And it's a huge puzzle that you have to manage and start um, building and reconstructing. Uh, who um, um, painted those frescoes on site? Uh, I still don't know. I have his hand. You see his hand. He is now drawing some worker on, on site. He had his own interest, but I don't have his uh, name. But someone was there doing that. So, um, Plus, um, on the aquarels, um, I assume that was maybe Baramki, but it was also a big team, uh, left marks beside the aquarels. Um, for example, uh, serial numbers uh, and room numbers beside other uh, marks. And those marks um, helped me also uh, reconstruct. So you see here, pencil marks uh, between two pieces, uh, two lines broken, and then you join the lines and you have maybe two pieces related. And uh, beside the serial number, I have some um, like letters, like NP4 uh, here. So it, it is referring to Northern Portico N and P for uh, Northern Portico and four is the area. So this is also helpful. So, uh, and again, although Grabar made great efforts to reconstruct most of the scenes, it seems that the requisite material was, was not uh, accessible to him at that time. This may well be attributed to the 1948 war and the fact that Baramki left Palestine for Lebanon at around that time. Dozens of paintings in the files were thus left uh, out of Grabar's discussion. So um, 
we start reconstructing two large blocks uh, lying one above the other uh, were uncovered in the debris attached to the southern wall of the entrance gate. Um, fresco remains which were found on these uh, blocks are reconstructed here to create a scene that reflects the uh, palace's prestige status. Um, one of the blocks uh, is illustrated with at least four human heads and two um, frontal faces. Behind and to the sides of the um, faces are black uh, pointed lines, which may indicate spears held by the men standing alongside. Uh, spears identify their bearers as soldiers. Uh, the reconstructed scene may relate to a, a military theme here, referred to here I will refer to it as the triumphal scene. Uh, this is the name like I, I would like to give. So here we build the pieces of this. Um, the two long ashlar uh, stone bearing the frescoes described above can be added to at least three other uh, blocks that are uh, reconstructed to create part of the scene. A block bearing soldiers holding spears is one of the major blocks. The piece is framed by thick border lines on two sides, or one uh, above the heads and one to their side. This border locates the piece as an upper corner of the scene. As such, it determines the border of this wall painting. Another piece <coughs> uh, with a blue sky background bears the head of uh, a man illustrated in profile with an outstretched hand. Um, this piece forms the skyline and occupies the upper part of the scene. As for the lower body of the scene, two pieces are proposed. Both are bordered on the sides and should therefore be placed closer to the frame. One uh, of them appears to be an illustration of three legs uh, around and uh, uh, around shields, sorry, and uh, uh, quivir. The lower parts of the legs are covered with gray straps and red bands, while uh, the upper parts are exposed. The curve of the shield is painted yellow and the quivir is uh, painted the same color as the leg stamp. These features suggest two soldiers standing, one frontal and one in movement to the right. One of them is holding a quiver to their back, a shield is positioned. The faces of a third soldier can be seen to the left near the border line. Only portions of the legs have survived, one of them partly covered with gray stamp. These two pieces, one depicting the heads of soldiers with spears in the background and the other depicting the lower bodies of soldiers, allow us to part partly reconstruct soldiers standing on the edge of the scene adjacent to the left border that is clearly marked with a black line. As for the middle body from the upper leg to the chest, we may learn uh, more from other pieces of fresco found in the vicinity. One piece um, bordered with a black line, similar to that in the previous pieces, depict different objects that are not fully identified. Uh, the most obvious feature is part of a roundish object composed of various pieces. Um, I will point here, this is the roundish, on which the palm of, um, and here is it, a uh, human hand can be recognized. A roundish object bordered with a yellow band is depicted beneath the palm. To the right of the palm is a yellow object decorated with black lines, creating a vegetal motif here. Uh, when placing this uh, piece above uh, the, the previous one below, <coughs> sorry, we see that the yellow line con continues at the bottom, uh, suggesting that this piece is part of the middle body of the figure. But this does not make the meaning of the scene any clearer. Uh, one possibility regarding the yellow border object is that it is a shield, the soldiers are standing and the shield is behind them. The other possibility turns the yellow border artifact into a wheel and the larger object, a hand depicted on its 
background into a chariot. In both cases, the yellow object decorated with a vegetal motif could be the lower edge of a tunic worn by one of the soldiers. Another uh, fresco fragment found in the southern wing uh, can shed light on these objects. The fragment bears a warrior wearing a yellow armor and a helmet. He holds a bow and arrow in his hand. This warrior is about to release the arrow into the upper part of the scene to a point which is not lo longer anymore there um, because of the fragmentary condition of, of the um, fresco. Um, and the warrior is the only clear feature in this uh, scene. So, <laughs> sorry, the archer's yellow armor is the link that may explain the nature of the yellow objects illustrated in the two blocks referred uh, to above. The archer is wearing what looks like an anatomical uh, wires with lappets and horizontal band with two horizontal lines on its upper part. Um, this armor uh, may differ from the archer's uh, armor and may be uh, uh, Palette armor, or le, le, like um, from the Roman period. If um, um, here we look, of course, this is an um, armor of an emperor and not a regular soldier, but we, we can uh, see the similarity with the lappets and other features. So, um, um, so we have here um, um, maybe a, a Roman style of, uh, of armor. We have other pieces uh, here. Um, the yellow um, is again um, the body or the chest armor. And the red uh, lines here uh, maybe are um, bands to hold uh, swords uh, those uh, soldiers uh, had. Um, uh, moreover, the warrior illustrated on the fresco fragment can shed light on the nature of the reconstructed scene. This warrior, uh, this one, wears a helmet while the warriors in the scene are without helmets. Uh, the absence of helmets in some Roman scenes led to the conclusion that they do not depict a, a martial procession, but rather are part of a ceremonial scene. Such a conclusion would also fit the reconstructed scene. Following this reconstruction, the scene depicts a battle or a triumphal scene where the armor is part of the bodies of, of the soldiers taking part in the scene. The soldiers' bodies or the armor, at least the armor depicted on the long piece below the uh, faces, should be placed below the faces. However, we have more faces than bodies depicted on the lower piece. Therefore, the position of this piece is not directly under the uh, face. So I'm referring to those pieces and where they should uh, be placed on this scene. I'm not sure about that. Uh, so it's not there. Uh, we have, as I said, more bodies than, uh, more faces than bodies. So uh, although only a small part of, uh, of the scene or even the immersion alone is reconstructed here and it's, it is hard to talk about its iconography, Something uh, may be said about the style. The soldier's armor is more in the Roman than the Eastern or Sasanian style. This style is determined by the equipment, including the uh, anatomical sorry, quarries, which is related to a Roman or Byzantine uh, army. Moreover, the skirts are more indicative of the Roman army than the Sasanian trousers. On account of the sea's uh, fragmental condition, only general impressions can be uh, described here. Drawing on well-known uh, examples from the antique era, uh, era without any documented connection to the artists from Jericho. The projecting uh, spears uh, recall the spears from the famous battle scene of Alexander dated to the 2nd century BC. 
In that mosaic, the two rival kings, the Persian Darius and the Macedonian Alexander face each other in battle. One of the clear fields is the skyline where uh, horrified faces can be seen and spears stick out, uh, while the lower part is less obvious. Horses and warriors clash, which makes it difficult to distinguish between the different features. The same applies to the lower body of the battle from Khirbat al mafjar where few pieces survive. But maybe we uh, here can recognize the shield and the chariot um, when uh, co comparing the two uh, scenes. Um, triumphal or battle scenes between Western, let's say, and Eastern powers can also be seen in the Arch of Galerius uh, in Salonika, which illustrates the triumphal scene of Galerius meeting Narses. The relief illustrates the moment when the two rulers meet in the middle of the panel, while members of the two armies are depicted to the sides. As is normal in such meetings, the concurring party stands steady behind its shields, crushing members of the defeated army who collapse onto the ground. Here, the Roman emperor wears body armor similar, similar to that depicted in the archer Archer scene from Jericho. Now, the majority of the pieces from which the scene is reconstructed were, as I said, retrieved from the southern porch. More precisely, near or even attached to the wall of the southern entrance tower. So, uh, the widest walls in the southern wings are the walls of the uh, entrance gate, which measure approximately five meters. Um, the blocks were thus once incorporated in the southern entrance tower. This does not mean that the paintings decorated the gate, rather they probably belonged to an upper floor that was partly supported by the entrance gate. More about the upper floor can be learned from Hamilton's uh, reconstructions of uh, the eastern and western wing. Hamilton proposed the existence of a basilical hall on the upper floor, with a central nave situated between two aisles, the center roofed with a rich timber roof, aisles with a flat roof, and a dome crowning an apse on the east. Following Hamilton's reconstruction of the upper floor above the entrance, and taking into consideration the size of the stone blocks decorated with frescoes, we end up with two possible walls that can support the upper floor walls. Those are the southern and the northern walls of the square room of the entrance tower. As the majority of the blocks holding the triumphal scene were retrieved to the south of the tower, and because of their weight, which prevented their collapse and dispersion far from their original location, it is suggested that the triumphal scene decorated the southern wall of the square room that was once incorporated in the entrance tower. On the same southern and northern walls, Hamilton reconstructed niches that were partly found in the southern porch that extended beyond the entrance facade. As the southern wall is long, the painting can be placed on the upper decorative register above the niches. This room had a large window that looked east to the Moab mountains. We can say <clears throat> that the power was not limited to representation. It was also present on site, especially when delegations or envoy uh, visited the palace. Evidence emerging from both sides of the late antique world, the Byzantine and the Sasanian, which the Umayyad inherited speaks of diplomatic protocol that included military uh, spectacles with ceremonial attire and weaponry. More evidence for such spectacle, uh, spe spectacles survives from the Abbasid period too. The historian Hilal uh, bin Muhsin al-Sabai describes a famous reception given in 970 by Khalif al-Muqtadir at the Dar al-Khilafah of Baghdad for an embassy sent by the Byzantine 
emperor, and I'm quoting and reading, an envoy from the Roman emperor can in the day, came, sorry, in the days of Al-Muqtadir, God bless him, as part of the preparation, the palace dar was covered with nice carpets and decorated with great installations. The door guards and their helpers and the chamberlains were stationed on the gateways, vestibules, passages, courtyards and audience halls of the palace. Soldiers from various military ranks were standing in two rows dressed with uh, nice clothes. Beneath them, the mules with gilded and silver saddles and to their sides, the reserve mules dressed in the same manner. Those displayed the equipment and the huge weapons. They were standing from Babel Shammasiya to Dar al Khilafa, and following them were the Chamberlain's slave pages and uh, Enochs that were dressed with nice suits, swords, and decorated belts. The pre and post Umayyad ceremonial weaponry consists of two linked chains that the Umayyads probably did not break. This helps us uh, visualize the human side of ceremonial life of Al Mafjar, while the reconstructed scene depicts the representation of power. However, uh, we have to remember that evidences on the ground are more uh, complicated than that. The entrance hall was lavishly decorated with stucco, such as uh, this lady here, or those men heads jutting out of the walls. Perhaps those features had some meaning or where uh, we are missing in our reading now. So uh, it's just a suggestion for part of the meaning. Um, um, more about um, the possible meaning of the triumphal scene perhaps can be added when comparing it to uh, the paintings in Qusayr Amra. Um, the Qasr, one of the palaces, if you cross the Jordan River and uh, like it's, it's less than one day journey with a camel to Jordan. Uh, so there we have a basilica with the caliph depicted on the wall, <coughs> sorry, um, opposite the uh, uh, entrance. On the um, um, side uh, wall of the panel, of what is called uh, the panel of the six kings by Grabar, and we have other names for it, but we go with six king kings. They are pointing to uh, the Khalif depiction. And according to one reading, accepting him to, let's say, the king's or ruler's party. Uh, hence, a scene situated not for uh, or, or uh, on the main, let's say, uh, um, uh, access, but on the side, and somehow is related to this uh, main uh, scene. Where is the Khalif? Now we we know that is uh, El Walid. Ben Yazid, at least in uh, Qusayr Amra, uh, and the one that Hamilton wanted to, uh, to be uh, related to also to Mafjar. Um, um, so perhaps in Khirbat al Mafjar, in the audience hall, uh, this triumphal panel is pointing or leading to the Khalif himself sitting there in the audience hall or uh, one of the uh, Amirs. Behind the Khalif, a huge window was open, uh, giving him eye access to the world outside, where maybe other kind of audience uh, than the one allowed to enter the hall was standing. This Khalif standing by the window sent us to the bath facade. And now we are moving to the uh, second main um, um, unit in this um, palace. And this is the bath. So we are looking on the facade. So behind the Khalif, a huge window was open, as I say, giving him eye access to the world outside. Now, um, um, here in, in, uh, in, uh, on the facade of the bath, we have um, a statues of, uh, of the Khalif situated in a niche above the arch of the main entrance to the bath hall. 
Now, following uh, Ettinghausen, or Richard Ettinghausen's suggestion, uh, this was part of the line that led by the end to the place where the Khalif or the prince who owned the uh, palace used to sit uh, in the hall, where uh, stone chains suspended from the roof held his crown above his head. So uh, back to the Qasr audience hall, we have to consider also the place of the window and the gaze outside and not only the one inside. So we have two directions, especially because of uh, this huge window that was uh, open uh, in this basilica. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, that, that was um, about this triumphal scene its place, the basilica, and uh, what we can say about that. More in this uh, eastern section, but in another room, not in the, the what we call the audience hall, uh, not so far from this hall, we have this um, uh, panel um, already uh, reconstructed by uh, Oleg Grabar, uh, and this was like, um, so we have this pattern uh, of interlacing circles, each occupied by, by a composite a creature with a dog's head, wings, and stylized peacock's tail, named by Grabar the dragon motif. And here uh, I will refer to it as the pseudo uh, uh, Seymour. Uh, the interlacing circles are uh, drawn in black and white outline and fit with head-shaped patterns uh, uh, lined in pink and white and colored pink, uh, red and white. So we have we now with the with the aquarels bring color and life to this panel. So the circles are colored in a mix of yellow and pink, and we have here um, had, um, um, different let's say, uh, styles of uh, this creature, uh, and this, uh, at least three um, types uh, of tails. Uh, here is one with, the, with arches, here uh, another one with the rosettes, uh, third one only with gray color, so um, it's not one uh, kind of, of this pseudo um, 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 Seymour, let's say. Um, and the, in between, there are ro rosettes uh, uh, situated in between the circles uh, line, uh, and they are composed of uh, uh, four hair shaped leaves. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, this was maybe in an upper uh, panel, and in the same room, uh, maybe below the, the Seymour uh, or pseudo Seymour panel, we have this panel with rosettes also um, um, reconstructed by Grabar, but now we have uh, those uh, colors. So um, <clears throat> if we follow uh, looking for this uh, pseudo um, 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 Seymour, we can find it also in other uh, Umayyad contexts, like we have uh, um, this um, symbol or this motif, let's say, in Qasr uh, al al-Sharqi, al-Gharbi, sorry, and Qasr uh, Hallaba, and in both cases, uh, it is um, encircled in uh, medallions, um, and uh, also rosettes are there. And also, we have such a pattern in what is called uh, the Hall of the Impasados in, in Afro Sayyab, which it's uh, Sogdian earlier than the uh, Umayyad in uh, nowadays uh, Uzbekistan. And we are looking on uh, the German the, and the pattern on uh, uh, one of the figures there. So uh, the latest research on the symbolism of this composite creature suggests that it was used to exalt the noblemen of Sogdiana and not as a representation of the Seymourg of Iranian mythology. That is to say, it's, it does not represent the Far or Hawarna mentioned in the Avesta. Now, uh, the Soido Seymourg also appears on the garments of the rider 
on the lower uh, rear wall of the great Iwan of Taqi Bustan, which shares at least three common points with that of El Mafjar. Both have a tail composed of one piece, and in both cases, the feathers of the tail are composed of a series of arcs arranged on uh, one above the other and decorated with a leaf motif. Two, uh, the medallions encircling the uh, Sidon Simurg are filled with a uh, hair shaped pattern. And third, the rosettes that are set in between the medallions are composed of hair shaped leaves. If the artist of Taqi Bustan did indeed uh, intended to imitate colors that were originally on the on textiles by engraving their pattern, the task of the artist from Khirbat al Mafjar was simpler as coloring uh, is much easier uh, than a uh, chiseling. The examples above uh, demonstrate the rule of the pseudo uh, Simur motif in the late antique uh, aristocratic world, by which time a reservoir, let's say, of different symbols and motifs had been adopted into different cultures. In this way, symbols moved between codes, including the Sogdian in the Far East with its connections to the Sasanians, Byzantians, and the and newly arrived Muslims. Following this line of thought, recent studies reject the idea that the figure is uh, the symbol of Mazdan culture, proposing instead that this figure represent divine glory, a concept easier for adopting adoption sorry, by Islam and Christianity than the Seymour. Matthew Canipa's reflection on cross-cultural motifs may enhance our understanding of uh, their meaning. All of these images I'm quoting here, uh, Canipa's, about those images, uh, the winged victory, the nimbus, and uh, ornamental motifs such as the bird in medallion and the seymour served as cross-cultural uh, mediators, meaningful in both cultural env environments and useful for conveying claims about the subversions between the two cultures. And here, here is uh, Kanipa's book, Two Eyes of Earth, is talking about <clears throat> like um, Roman and Sasanians. In this case, the motifs did not necessarily originate in one culture and move to the other. Rather, the Roman and the Sasanian subversions were often mutually engaged with a third phenomenon under the watchful eyes of their opponent. So, end of quote. In conclusion, in even if the pseudo simul is not a symbol of the Hawarna or the Far, and even if it does not represent the Simul from the epic of Zar and Rustam, it is still a rare motif. Evidence for its rarity is its sole appearance on the garment of the rider of Taqi Bustan, while most of the figures depicted in the grotto were garments, garments with uh, uh, different patterns, including beds and uh, rams. Moreover, it uh, decorates the clock of one of the central figures in the whole, whole of, of the ambassadors in uh, Afrosayab. So, um, <clears throat> there are, as I said before uh, I uh, end my talk with this uh, concluding uh, remarks, there are a lot of um, more uh, pieces to reconstruct and together I'm just bringing some examples of uh, human faces um, imitation marble, um, maybe you can recognize also some Sasanian again with this, those trousers here, um, some uh, architectural features, so things still uh, need to uh, be deciphered or reconstructed. Um, so the reconstructed motifs and scenes reflect artistic development during the Umayyad period. Uh, artists active in this period were basically integrating two traditions, the Sasanian and the Roman Byzantian, the newly established visual language emerging out of the two tradition can be seen in the various Umayyad monuments, either religious such as the Dome of the Rock and the Great Mosque of Damascus or palatial complexes, for instance, Usair Amra and Qasr al-Hir al-Gharbi. 
Religious buildings bear only non-figural motifs, some of them similar to the motifs at Khirbat al-Mafza, such as the scrolls and the rosette. The palace uh, repertoire is larger and more diverse, encompassing animals and humans. The wealth of artistic techniques and motifs seen in Khirbat al-Mafzar is unique. The most popular artistic uh, technique is without doubt the stucco, which covers huge areas of the palace, including the bath hall. Although the stucco was applied mainly to the walls of the uh, ground floor and entrance porch, fresco paintings seem to have been limited to the upper floor. The audience hall above the entrance corridor was in all probability planned as the main reception hall in the palace, if not the throne room. Visitors were led to the staircase on the northern side of the facade, ascended the stairs that led up to the main entrance of the audience hall. Once in the audience hall, visitors could see the triumphal scene and probably other scenes that are no longer visible. The scene Facing the entrance of the audience hall of Qusayr Amra appears what is generally accepted as, as the figure of the patron, Walid ibn Yazid. However, the figure facing the entrance in Qusayr Amra is not the only one of importance. The figures on the side walls leading to the image of the patron uh, in the main niche contribute to the scene of um, sorry, of to the sense of prestige conveyed by this hall, the triumphal uh, scene in Khirbat al mafzar probably situated on the southern side wall, sends sends a similar message of power to palace visitors. Moreover, in Khirbat al mafzar the pattern. A patron whom audience is met in the hall could glimpse the view to the east through a wide window. This horizontal axis connected the patron with one kind of visitor from one side and possibly another kind of visitor from uh, the other. In addition, following uh, Priscilla Sushik line of analysis in relation to the decoration of the bath hall facade and its domed vestibule and her connection between the two parts we may suggest that the meaning of the audience hall paintings situated above the main entrance probably related to the figures or the symbols that were once on this facade. A related message is delivered by other panels that decorate, uh, decorate rooms on the upper floor of the palace. In one room on the southern wing, human figures are depicted in Eastern and Western custom. On the northern wing, other royal motifs were uncovered, especially the panel with the pseudo simul, which was a symbol of royalty in late antiquity. Those panels were probably placed one above the other with the scrolls and other uh, panels uh, uh, with the imitation marble on the dadu. And by the end, to Paraphrase, let's say, uh, Grabar, we may conclude by saying that the adaptations to the complex uh, visual repertoire made by the patron or the artists of the Mafzar demonstrate considerable intellectual and aesthetic involvement and not merely novorish uh, whimsy. And I would like to uh, thank here um, uh, also um, um, uh, the curator, the previous curator uh, of the archive or keeper of the archive in Rockefeller uh, Museum who uh, helped me a lot here with a construction, Silvia e Carp Carpoeco. And um, um, my uh, also, um, a friend Slava Pilski, who also helped me with the uh, plans and um, um, work uh, like uh, those uh, to reconstruct and place those pieces in um, like um, a good uh, shape and uh, image. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Tofik, uh, very much for this 
very interesting talk on this amazing palace <laughs> and and for bringing the spotlight on the on the wall paintings of course you know Herbert Almafchar is much better known for his mosaics and not so much for the paintings maybe and also for for bringing the paintings, the wall paintings in, in connection to other palaces. You mentioned uh, Kassel Heir of Harbi and, uh, and of course, Hosai Ramra. And I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, you talked about, you know, the royal figures and the battles, and you talk about the possible uh, stylistic relationships. I wonder whether you work uh, also in the work in progress that you're doing, whether you have um, you have encountered any scene that can be a narrative scene, maybe uh, maybe difficult to decipher in the same way that Kosai Ramra now, uh, obviously, especially in in recent years, has been uh, the subject of much studies. Uh, so I was wondering whether you had any insight about that for this, for Hedbert and Um I have to say, unfortunately, I, I still do not recognize any narrative that, um, um, that, that it, it's, um, <clears throat> and um, I also, if just maybe there, but uh, there is, but I also uh, think also the Stokos are not really, uh, and I have to say also, also the Stokos uh, still need to be um, um, studied. Like, uh, of course, uh, they are well published in a Hamilton uh, book, but there are like thousands, uh, and then now it's not hundreds, but thousands of pieces still there in the museum um, waiting to someone to connect. So, um, uh, and there I don't uh, remember also uh, a narrative, let's say. Mm. Yes, interesting. Thank you very much. There are a couple of uh, points in the chat. Uh, one is, uh, is there a difference from Jamie Comstock? Uh, is there a difference between Simurg and Semurg? Uh, like I, I have to say that I decided to uh, play with the um, naming just to refer um, that this is like um, uh, not the um, uh, let's say uh, Avestan or the Iranian as as we used to uh, refer to it, and there are now uh, let's say new thoughts about it. So this is my point of uh, using uh, different naming. So I don't know if there is a um, real difference between Sinmur or Simur, like, uh, or, and if I will read from the Sahname, it will be written Sinmur, uh, of course. Uh, so, uh. And um, uh, Gunnar Heidson, splendid presentation. Are there any pre-7th century structures on the site? Um, <clears throat> Pre-7th century in, in recent excavations by Donald Whitcomb, as I said, and the Palestinian Antiquity Authority uh, on the northern part, and also uh, not, so not far from the bath hall and the bath itself, they didn't um, um, like tackle such um, like period, so it's it seemed it was um, um, like oh, everything there is uh, started with the Omeyad, let's say. Mm. And uh, uh, Karen Pinto, please see my article on find of earliest painting of Moon in Kosai Ramra, and she puts the link there. Thank you. Um, yes, are there any other comments or questions? Please write in the chat. Uh, so Fatma says, what is the technique of these paintings? Are they fresco or a secco? 
Um, I didn't like uh, examine them. Uh, we have only few pieces still preserved in the museum, and they are, uh, I have to say, were like not so in my hand reach. So I, I couldn't, uh, let's say, examine them. Uh, and uh, the way they were, uh, um, let's say, applied and which kind of materials used there. And as I said at the beginning, I worked mainly with the aquarels. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's something again in progress to look at. Um, I was actually quite uh, uh, interested in these aquarels that you showed at the beginning. You said that they, they, we don't know who made them, but, but you know, sort of the connection with, of, obviously, with Herzfeld's reconstruction of the wall painting of Samara comes to mind and uh, other reconstruction of that period. So that it's interesting to see the methodology of reconstruction of wall paintings that was common. Yeah, this is um, also um, on my, uh, let's say, uh, list to, to check. Um, but uh, plus, uh, there are a lot of, um, um, let's say, letters um, preserved that have some relation to the team working there. So you have uh, surveyors and uh, but the painter, maybe his name is there, but they are not referring to him as, you know, uh, as, as the painter. He was doing various maybe works. So uh, still, uh, I, I don't have his uh, name still. Uh, yeah. And um, if I may add, but, but this uh, last um, um, slide, um, it is always here in, in Khirbat al-Mafjar, al it's a partial, let's say, reading, um, because, um, I, of course, I divided the frescoes um, from the stoccos and the, the, the mosaics, but um, those people who decorated or style like um, planned uh, the thing, they didn't thought about me dividing uh, the, the methods. They had the, their own idea complete, let's say. So what is really missing is all to reconstruct, but also to uh, connect between the different uh, motives. Um, like, so this is really, uh, <clears throat> let's say complicated, not something um, easy to do. Yeah, sure. To see whether the a, a whole program was yeah. put together coherently. Yeah. Um, Valerie Gonzalez, I'm wondering about the symbolization of this iconography that obviously draws from the various late antique repertoire. Uh, do you not think that there was a change of symbolic order? in the Umayyad context because of the uh, dynastic, the Islamic metaphysics that led to a different understanding of the material. I'm dealing with these questions in a recent article. Any insight on that? Interesting. Uh, thank you, Valerie. Um, I have to say, I, I'm, as you see, I was really trying to understand and to uh, put together pieces. Um, and this is like an, an advanced level, uh, Valerie, what, what you're asking about. Uh, because at first I want to show those, what were the, let, let's say, uh, the, the features, what, what, what is standing there, and then uh, uh, I will look for, uh, let's say, uh, those changes inside the dynastic uh, or the, the, the Umayyad. Uh, yeah, sorry, but uh, I'm not there still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, interesting questions. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, oh, there was a, a follow up from Fatma. Are the paintings well fixed? Do they get deteriorated when you touch them? <laughs> Again, Fatmas, um, I'm not allowed to touch them. I have to say, this is uh, um, out of the uh, 
circumstances here, not much of them are there. And for example, there is maybe only one piece from this uh, triumphal scene, what I call the triumphal, triumphal scene that is still there. Most of them are not there anymore. They disappeared in, uh, or they were lost uh, since uh, back then. So um, I'm not really um, touching the materials, um, uh, but they are in, um, let's say, in a, in, still in a good shape. They are dry, not falling apart, uh, as I can say, without touching them. They are still, the pieces that are there, they are still uh, standing. Maybe this uh, can answer you your question about the, the, the nature of the material. Yeah, the material is not falling down. And uh, back uh, during the 40s, uh, Baramki's team uh, put some modern plaster on the edges uh, of those pieces, uh, so they are somehow uh, kept and not falling down. Uh, I hope I, under uh, I answered you. So uh, apart from your uh, work on the documentation and reconstruction of the, of the paintings, is there a conservation program? Um, the, like uh, on site, uh, which is Jericho, uh, nowadays uh, West Bank, as I said to you before we started this conversation, uh, there, there was uh, recently um, a new roof uh, inserted above the bath uh, hole, like, uh, so all the mosaics are exposed and you are uh, welcome to visit. This is one side of the thing. The other side of, of Kirbat al-Mafjar is kept in Jerusalem in uh, the Rockefeller Museum, which uh, this museum uh, somehow is frozen, uh, let's say, fro since the 50s, uh, out of the status quo, let's say, uh, of the, out of the uh, political circumstances. So there is no real uh, people touching those, uh, the stokos especially, uh, they are there and there, there is no real uh, like uh, work on them. Uh, here and there, there are some uh, scholars coming to scan, to picture, um, 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 a, Ignacio Archie came and scanned and pictured the Stokos. He wanted to create, maybe he did. Uh, he joined Donald Whitcomb a team and he wanted to create 3D uh, models for the Stokos. And they were planning to uh, insert those uh, models uh, in the small museum on site. So visitors who cannot, let's say, cross the border and come to Jerusalem, can at least have um, uh, some experience or uh, to see how those fre frescoes are in there. So yeah, mm. long um, uh, answer for for a simple question, but uh, this is those are the circumstances. Sure, sure. no, that's very interesting. And uh, as Valerie says in the chat, uh, there is definitely a huge archaeological work that remains to be done. Um, I was thinking, um, you know, the, the what you call the triumphal scene and the reconstruction. Um, so it could have been uh, like those triumphal scenes that you showed, like the um, the mosaics, the famous mosaics. But do you think that it could also be uh, reflect? like a ceremony that was taking place uh, rather than being the reflection of it of a generic triumphal scene there is of course there is the possibility um, if we will uh, we, i will manage to put more pieces this will can give us um uh, like a hint uh, yeah, maybe it, it is referring to, let's say, um, 
a kind of a his historical, uh, let's say, ceremony, something that really happened, or they are referring to it as something that happened, yeah. Uh, but still, I don't have uh, evidences for, for that, yes. No, as you saw, those pieces are scattered there, not really um, um, helping uh, us to, to give this. Uh, and other small pieces, um they you you have the feeling and it's uh, that they are like um decorations uh, wall decorations uh, as as we have in and now sending you to another world like in pompeii like the, so the the architecture small figures uh so uh, you see that it's it's only decoration like it's um they they didn't um let's say Put a lot of effort to uh, give facial facial features, or it's just like figures in, in in a landscape or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, so then you have a series of thank you in the chat. Um, is is any uh, are there any other points or questions for Tofik? Otherwise, is there anything you want to add, Tofik, about your future research? You just continue. You will continue with this putting together a picture. I am. I understand. Yes. 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 This is well. And the big challenge is, uh, which I don't know if I will reach, um, is <laughs> to com to combine uh, between the different, uh, and let's say. Um, the stucco, the frescoes, uh, yeah. That would be very interesting, actually. Yeah, yeah. So I, I look on it as, you know, uh, we have a book and we are reading different chapters. Um, if we want to understand this book, we have to re really start from the beginning till the end. I don't know if I'm the one suitable for that, but I uh, at least maybe will add a chapter, let's say. <laughs> Well, thank you very, very much and uh, a virtual applause from everybody. Thank and you. thank you, Tofik. You have lots of thank you in the chat that you can look at from everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much for this generous in invitation. I enjoyed it. Uh, so, Sam, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.